The 6-5 is live. We are back, still breathing after a coast-to-coast, island-to-island hop. A couple red eyes in there. Dan, it's great to see you, my friend. This is just, you know, this is the relaxing part of the week. Uh, we're almost at the finish line. I guess maybe the finish line are Saturdays because we just don't know when to say no. Yeah, there really is no weekend, but there really are no rules if you can plan your life accordingly. Uh, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship. Uh, but yeah, I mean, look, it's been a heck of a week. We did do some travel. There was a 41 hour long trip to get me from Austin to Maui. Um, I got to go home for a few minutes in between broken planes, missed flights, read bookings, new connections. An F1 race was somewhere tucked in the middle of there. Didn't get to go to the race race, but went to the pre-race. Um, but hey, I'm back. I didn't get a tan either. So I was in Hawaii, no sun, no tan. But other than that, I'm doing good. How are you, buddy? Doing okay. You know, got up at uh, 3 a.m. on uh, Monday morning, East Coast, and made my way out to uh, Maui. That was about a 20, 20 hour trip. Uh, <laughs> was out there long enough to actually, I didn't even have time to smell a rose. Um, but I did uh, go to some great keynotes, met with some uh, of the uh, Qualcomm execs out there uh, like you did. And then I th- actually saw you on the red eye flight. Uh, coming from uh, Maui uh, into Dallas. I, I, I saw you. Were, were we on the same flight? What a funny, funny coincidence. You know, God, man plans, God laughs, works in a funny way. On the second leg, we were even next to each other. And people probably think we did it on purpose. Uh, but it was just a just crazy happenstance. Now, sadly, it was like one of my best tweets of the week was when I said, hey, it's you, instead of the long, thoughtful uh, stuff that I write about uh, the future of apps, AI, uh, silicon innovation, China, because we know people are stupid. I mean, not you, the watchers, because if you're here, you're smart. But, um, you know, the higher quality of the content, sometimes I do one <laughs> to lower odds that anyone's going to read it and pay attention. Exactly. So let's dive in here. we got a great show for you. We're going to be talking about the Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit 2024. Uh 6.5 was there meeting with senior executives from Qualcomm, and we had a special guest that uh, they chose Dan to interview over me. And, and not that I brought that up, but, you know, I think it's because I'm a huge Red Bull fan. But anyways. You're, you're pretty mature about these things, too, and that's what I really like about you. Well, I mean, it's, that's the great thing about being 56 is you get mature and you don't carry over any of those adolescent uh, bad uh, FOMO things. But anyways, we're going to hit the summit. We're going to hit uh, service now earnings. Uh, we're going to talk about a related topic to Qualcomm, which is ARM uh, decided to give Qualcomm 60 days notice. Uh, we're going to be talking about IBM earnings and they dropped Granite 3.0 models for enterprise uh, NVIDIA, I think this is the end of the conversation about the NVIDIA Blackwell design flaw. It is fixed. Is it fixed? What happened? And then we're going to end this segment with SAP earnings. Daniel, and we're going to do what I know you love, which is uh, I'm going to call it. Your number? Yeah, I'm going to call your number. Call my number. Yeah, so uh, Qualcomm, they've been on a multi year revenue diversification uh, plan. Uh, gosh, for the past year uh, plus, uh, they've talked a lot about how they've grown in the automotive market, that gigantic $50 billion backlog, uh, and also getting into the PC market where, uh, quite frankly, they have redefined uh, the segment. I don't, I don't use those words uh, loosely, but they came out with their very high performance, low battery life <coughs> um, designs. Uh, both AMD and Intel did respond with offerings of their own. But this Snapdragon Summit, really the lead here was the new mobile core, uh, the new Snap uh, Snapdragon 8 Elite, which is based on a second-generation uh, Orion core. And uh, Orion 1 is inside of the uh, PC, but they made some pretty incredible modifications and the although we didn't do any of the testing uh, they did let people uh, test 
you know, on some uh, basic uh, synthetic benchmarks. And um, for the first time in many, many years, it uh, surpasses uh, Apple on a few key benchmarks. It meets them on single threaded uh, benchmarks, but pretty much blows them away on anything that's uh, multi-threaded. Uh, the GPU and the NPU uh, aren't, aren't as clear, but with phones going on sale, uh, you can benchmark them in the next month. That was the big news there. I think the set, by the way, uh, puts them in a very good position. Uh, they already dominate a premium Android, but uh, there is a potential, particularly outside of Western countries, where they can move, potentially move a few points of market share uh, related to Apple. Uh, I'm also, you know, piqued everybody's interest is would these next generation Orion cores and design make their way into the next generation PC? Uh, the next uh, big announcement was around automotive, where we saw, imagine that, the Orion, new Orion cores going into not only the cockpit solutions, but the ADAS solutions. We had a great uh, sit down. Uh, with uh, Nicole, who runs that business, uh, among others. But it's too early to see necessarily uh, how this does in comparison from, let's say, what NVIDIA is doing or what Intel is doing. But what I can say is, is that monster backlog they have, which is up to $50 billion, is proof positive that their strategy is working. And the way that I would characterize their strategy as meeting customers where they are. If they want an integrated solution, uh, top to bottom, hardware, software, and services, they can offer that. If they only want to take bits and pieces of the solution and leverage their own software, they can do uh, that too. It is so funny, just remembering back even a few years ago before Qualcomm had even announced that it was doing ADAS, they invited me to do a ride uh, in a car that was, you know, driven by um, uh, Snapdragon uh, processors. And then here we are, I think roughly four years later, uh, with this monster backlog that, that really has three parts to it. You have the communications, right, which has been the 3G, 4G, 5G communications, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, you have the in uh, cockpit, essentially everything you see and all the entertainment uh, services that uh, go along with that. And then finally, uh, ADAS and full, uh, full self-driving. We haven't necessarily seen the uh, full self-driving uh, in a car yet, but I am sure we will as Qualcomm has put together what I, I believe is a scalable uh, solution to get in that market. <laughs> the other thing, that uh, we don't necessarily think of that could come out of this group is are things like robots, and you know those companies who aren't doing their own chips, like uh, the folks over at Tesla, uh, robots, uh, two-wheel uh, devices like motorcycles, and even think uh, uh, industrial. So, hoping to get a lot more information uh, financially from automotive. Uh, PC and the mobile market uh, coming into Qualcomm's financial analyst day, which uh, is next month. Yeah, there was a lot uh, to you know unpack. This wasn't unpacked, but Qualcomm did share quite a bit, and it kind of all started off with a bit of a storytelling exercise by CEO Cristiano Oman. We had him on our show, um, and we will publish that probably in the next few days. But uh, it really started off with him talking about what AI in the future looks like, which was a bit unique because this is a company, remember a couple of years ago, it was like banging on 5G, it was banging on, you know, SOC advancements, features, images, photos. I mean, and this was an all AI show. I, I don't know how much you remember the kind of like go back two or three years and just how different the content has become. You know, he was talk talking about agents. He was talking about on device. He was talking about LLMs running locally. And that was sort of the meat and potatoes is you can sort of sense that the industry, the hardware industry is, is becoming cognizant of the narrative and the impact that AI is going to have and how they're going to need to position themselves to stay differentiated 
And so that was very evident. And then, of course, the company did focus on how Orion is going to become, you know, sort of platform distributed. So whether you're going from phone to PC to automotive, it is going to be building continuity. And this really aligns to that diversification story that the company's been telling over the last couple of years. You know, you and I said for a long time, too much risk in handsets, too much risk in Apple. It's really done a good job of being able to offload those concerns. Of course, there's some new risk related to its ongoing uh, dispute with ARM, and we'll hit on that a little bit later. But this uh, Orion platform that it is building and this elite sort of everything we do, there's an elite platform that's got continuity across the different you know, device uh, subsets. I think it really shows, it goes to show that Qualcomm has created efficiency. And, and of course they're doing so by continuing to grow, continuing to develop and being cognizant of how they're spending on R&D. And that's another area that the company's done pretty well. So this all really became evident here at the event, uh, Pat. You know, I, I think as we spent some time there and as we know, um, there are some question marks, you know, great technology, but we are in a particular era of the market where AIPCs, how good are they doing and are they growing? Uh, our intelligence team will actually be launching some forecast data on this over the next couple of weeks. Handsets, you know, we've seen the major pullbacks in iPhone 16. And while that doesn't directly impact Qualcomm that much as their content's fading out of the Apple ecosystem, the question mark about what is driving people to buy handsets and how quickly will this AI cycle really take place is another question mark. But I think when it comes to you know automotive and you hit this and you kind of really went into detail is, I mean, they've done just a remarkable job of winning basically all the designs across every OEM and doing so, as you said, in sort of a piece part or full system implementation. And I love that in our conversation with Nicole DeGaulle, the group GM of that business and, and several others within Qualcomm, he really said they're focused on business that's out there to be had today. So, you know, there's Robo Taxi Day, which is great and that's fun. And then there's the cars that people are going to buy in the next 12, 24 months. There's the implementation of ADAS, infotainment, telematics, and Qualcomm seems to be there and the revenue is ramping really quickly. Pat, I will end on saying there is a weird missing element of 5G. <laughs> I don't know um, if this is sort of just because AI is the thing, because it's a distraction, because 5G was kind of never amounted to what it was expected of it. But it is kind of fascinating that this was the all about 5G thing for about five years. And now as we enter this AI era, I, I don't think I heard it one time in three days on stage. And that was really, really interesting to me. Yeah, it certainly uh, remains to be a huge part of their their business. And even though Apple, you know, the thesis, I mean, Apple's been going away for seven years ever since uh, Apple uh, bought uh, Intel's uh, 5G assets, uh, you know, Get, give a company in the top five valuation enough time, uh, they're gonna, going to going to to figure that uh, out. And by the way, even if Qualcomm over time loses the digital part, uh, good luck getting rid of the uh, of the RF part. So, anyways, let's move forward. You know, Apple's about twenty five percent of global uh, uh, smartphones, and <laughs> Qualcomm still has access to that that other seventy five percent. Hey, let's dive into uh, ServiceNow uh, earnings. Daniel, um, were, were, was that a company able to ride the AI uh, transactional uh, wave? <laughs> You've put out some good tweets this week. Uh, I've seen a little snark in the in the in the Moorhead, uh, you know, Twitter wave about agents, <laughs> about agent advertising, about competition, and you know, there seems to be a battle, a war being fought between uh, you know CEO Mark Benioff and Salesforce and Microsoft right now, but very quietly, or maybe not so quietly anymore, ServiceNow seems to be building a platform and a series of agents and announcing partnership after partnership and just absolutely annihilating growth of enterprise software. Um, and it did it again. So, you know, you're talking about a beating across the board. You, had, you know, I had the chance to spend some time with CEO Bill McDermott, uh, the, uh, the day of earnings. The actual number of releases that came out with the earnings was palpable partnerships with Rumini partner you know partnerships uh, with numerous uh, consulting firms big consulting firms um, partnerships with databricks with snowflake and a new uh, Nvidia building out generative agents partnership that right now looks very very promising tons of growth in the company's large customer base over 5 million over 1 million 
did 15 deals over 5 million in ACV, up double or up 50% on a year over year basis, six deals over 10 million. The company's deal size is growing palpably. And this has a lot to do with the fact that they're moving from kind of this ITSM company to this, we do everything that you can do with data. And we're going to do it on the now platform with agents. And I think they're not so quietly a, comp a competitor now to everybody. And that's kind of an interesting change. They had a great opportunity to coexist, but isn't that often how competition rises? They, they rise right alongside until they get big enough, they get enough cash flow, they get enough growth, and then they can start to, to hammer into areas. So they've expanded into HR, digital experiences, CRM, and now they're really talking about data management. So Bill talked on the call about this 200 plus billion dollar data management opportunity. And Pat, how much time have we spent talking over the years about the data fabric impact of a hybrid data fabric, the opportunity for applications to be able to point at data across different data architectures and types and do so in a way that can enable less abstractions, more answers, more uh, efficiency inside the enterprise, and the opportunity for agents to do what agents can ultimately do for the company, which is navigate and orbit between different enterprise software silos to be able to provide the best generative out outcomes and outputs and be able to reason through a multiple layer set of decisions, you know, to help companies understand opportunities, understand attrition, understand supply chain complexities, understand uh, service gaps. And that's where it's all heading. Now, again, you know, some of this talk, and I wrote that piece this week about apps going away. I think it's, it's a little sensational. I even put it in my tweet when I wrote the story. But over time, what is gonna happen is, is, is you know, Pat, I'll say it, you can shake your head and disagree with me, I'm no one likes using their app, their their enterprise apps. They're just not, and I'm not saying you disagree. I'm saying you can if you want, but nobody that I know is really like, I love my experience of trying to get a report out of name tool, Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, Dynamics. It's not like one is great and the rest are bad. It's like no one really thinks it's great, but we also know that our entire business sits on top of these data sets and we need to know what's going on. So the idea that if you kind of like the experiences of, generative tools like Cope, um, like, well, not Copilot itself, but OpenAI, like um, Anthropic and, and, and their, uh, you know, LLMs. And you want to be able to just use multimodal to ask a question, hey, show me my next 30 days, my best sales opportunities, and to be able to navigate across all your platforms, all your data, all your tools to be able to generate in real time a dashboard based on role and permissions and all the uh, sovereignty of data and, and not all that doing it one time, that's where it's got to go. Whether this is going to get us there, that's where it has to go. And that's what I see. Bill is very adamant that this is the company that's going to get it done. Are they the company that's going to get it done? I mean, look, the the I let the growth speak for itself. It's hard to argue with this many quarters of growing at two and even three times the enterprise software market, according to our intelligence. Um, so that speaks to a lot of what's been going on. I think there's an opportunity. And if Microsoft and Salesforce are going to have it out, it could be an interesting opportunity for service now to quietly just come right through the middle of them as they are having it out. But I also think that these companies all get partnerships, they get ecosystem, Pat. Um, so a lot there, you know, I didn't hit tons and tons of detail on the earning. The last thing I'll leave about the earnings is huge RPO, huge backlog, which means the next few quarters look very optimistic uh, for the company. Cause as you know, that's kind of how fast works. Yeah, good breakdown here. Uh, sorry about all the coughing here. I did a 500 yeah. RPO at the uh, very end of my uh, workout and I'm, uh, I'm pretty uh, pretty freaking gassed. Oof. Yeah, it was tough. I did hit above average, uh, but I expected to do, you know, be superior oh. to my uh, age group. I, I, I did very good, but not as good as I would have liked. I also did it at the end of my workout, not at the beginning. Uh, yeah, ServiceNow, I went to their Big Ten event uh, with you in, in Las Vegas, uh, where, you know, where we did some selfie analysis. Um, <laughs> With a lot of the senior uh, execs, uh, not only from ServiceNow but also uh, Jensen and Michael Dell, was pretty awesome. But uh, two big things came out of that. Uh, first of all, is the declaration that we want to be the trans the AI transaction layer on top of these uh, enterprise uh, SaaS apps that have a crappy experience. And yes, they do. They're absolutely horrible. I mean, I'm just gonna gonna tell you that right now. And I think when we look at what a good experience is, it, it are, there are things like on a smartphone, right? Uh, these are not like that. And it's not just putting a better UI layer, layer but it's putting the transaction layer 
uh, so you can actually do something with that. One conversation, very important conversation that began that, that again, I had the most questions on was what's your data management strategy? I felt a little bit like it, it caught ServiceNow off guard <clears throat> a bit because of all the questions, but uh, to their credit, within a month of their Big Tent event, they really leaned in and they had a much, I think, a better articulation of what their data management uh, strategy is and uh, what it needs to be going on uh, forward. now. Like you said, we've been talking about uh, data management before AI uh, for a, a long time here. And we also got to give uh, Mark Benioff credit at Salesforce. He hit this uh, super hard and his biggest growth percentage wise is, is from his data uh, cloud. Hats off though to ServiceNow on, you know, where we're looking at enterprise SaaS hitting it at single digits. Uh, right now, industry wide, and now there are pockets like uh, with you know certain uh, ERP vendors that that we might be talking about soon uh, that that are having some uh, a pretty uh, good good growth, and we've seen some pretty good growth from uh, Oracle ERP, but the rest is is not great, and I think a lot of that is uh, first of all some digestion uh, left over from the pandemic but also uh, budget sh shifting uh, to AI. And I think that's, that's hurting, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, the, the uplift uh, in the overall market. So let's move forward here, uh, Daniel, and uh, we'll go to the next topic because we hate talking about chips. And that is that essentially uh, the day after uh, Qualcomm's big uh, announcements, uh, ARM declared that it was canceling Qualcomm's licensing uh, agreement. And let me let me give a little bit of breakdown here. So ARM is not in the business of, of making chips. It is in the business of licensing intellectual property, and that's about 50% of their business. So what it essentially is is an upfront payment for the right to use ARM's technology in your product development, right? Apple has this, uh, NVIDIA has this uh, from the failed uh, takeover bid, Huawei has this, and, and Qualcomm has this. A company that Qualcomm bought, Nuvia, had a license uh, as well. And about 50% of ARM's business are royalties. And these are ongoing payments based on either uh, the sale price of the final products uh, or the chip uh, price. And you typically see these types of structures when you're buying uh, these macros. Qualcomm is primarily in the business of selling chips, secondarily in the business of selling intellectual property, primarily around uh, 5G. So with the basis of that, uh, Qualcomm bought, again, this company called Nuvia, uh, the ex-Apple uh, Bionic architects and, and designers. And Qualcomm used, these, uh, used this uh, capability to create processors for what we saw in the PC market and what we recently saw in the smartphone and the auto market. Uh, Arm is arguing that Qualcomm should pay the higher licensing fee, and again, it it, it's funny, I, I, I asked so many people, hey, which, which was higher, the Nuvia cost or the Qualcomm cost? And there's also been uh, discussions, I, I know from ARM, that says, hey, you might have bought Nuvia, but you do not have the right to distribute their, their intellectual property. So ARM is suing Qualcomm, I believe Qualcomm uh, countersued and it's supposed to go to trial on December 16th. So what ARM <clears throat> with the 60-day notice said is essentially you have to stop selling any, uh, any uh, chips with our licensing IP in it uh, within 60 days. And there's two ways to look at that. And I know that you know, I've gotten calls from a lot of people, both sides uh, setting the record straight uh, with me, uh, on one angle, you have to look at upside. So uh, let's just say that ARM would win, 
it's absolute upside for the company because that incremental uh, licensing revenue is not in their P&L uh, now. Now, the opportunity cost, uh, if, if they don't get that, would be higher just based on the size of the revenue difference between uh, the revenue and operating income difference between uh, the two companies. The other way to look at this is that let's just say that Arm got a win here and they got the ITC to blockade all of the Qualcomm chips. That would mean that Qualcomm couldn't sell uh, any of its chips with Nuvia-based architecture uh, in it. And this might even extend to all uh, Qualcomm, uh, sorry, all ARM licensing, which which means it, it couldn't ship any of its products that are that are ARM based uh, to anybody. Now, in my mental uh, model, and I did, you know, I outlined this uh, on <clears throat> Yahoo Finance, is that I find that uh, an ITC blockade is highly unlikely, uh, and and the reason is I, I've seen this before. How many times has Apple received an ITC block? for stomping on somebody's uh, intellectual property. I think I counted five, okay? And how many times did the ITC say you have to stop uh, selling uh, uh, in there? Once, and it was Massimo for uh, Apple Watch Apple Watch sensors. Uh, heck, uh, even um, uh, the President of the United States intervened uh, when Apple lost the ruling, I think it was Trump, uh, lost the ruling um, and got an ITC blockade. So mentally, <laughs> I am I do not see that uh, as an opportunity because quite frankly, uh, it would destroy Qualcomm, okay? And I don't think that uh, I don't think that would be necessarily in the cards. Net net, I do believe that these companies will find a happy ending uh, to this. Uh, their customers are not happy. Their ecosystem uh, is uh, is not happy, and we need to get this thing uh, straightened out uh, one way or another. I think, like all negotiations, I think we'll uh, land uh, somewhere uh, in uh, in the middle between uh, what everybody is asking for. Yeah, that was a great breakdown, Pat. I. I think there's a lot there and you know I've had a number of conversations uh, you know we've had chances internally talk to executives across the spectrum you, you give the background what, I, what I'll say is a couple of things that, that come to mind one is you and I both and, and I've certainly followed seven or eight different Qualcomm cases substantial litigation with Qualcomm FTC CFTC JFTC KFTC um, Apple Samsung Huawei um, you know, the Broadcom uh, attempted takeover, uh, which is a little different than traditional. But Pat, this company is incredibly proficient at dealing, prolific almost, at dealing with these kinds of situations. And so it, it's a very interesting sort of moment for ARM and, you know, Qualcomm, two companies that are uh, have extensive legal sort of uh, foundations, right? Both have big licensing businesses, both probably have almost as many lawyers as engineers um, in jest. But in serious, you know, the joke about Qualcomm has been the world's largest law firm. Um, you know, a lot of lawyers, a lot of lawyers. And, and the companies have done a great job in very tough situations. And this is seems to be just another hop, skip, and a jump in the life of being Qualcomm. Having said that, you know, on the surface, ARM seems to have a very real case to be made here. I mean, I think in history, ARM has almost always granted permission to take over, uh, to utilize license and take over. This one never got approved. Uh, it was somewhat cut and dry in the architectural license that Nuvia had that it wasn't transferable without ARM's permission. So on the surface, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward thing, but that's the surface. Mm -hmm. Problem is, is in law, it's never as obvious as what's on the surface. And so now you've got a battle, and, and by the way, to your point about ITC blocks and everything else that goes on, you've got a battle that impacts a lot more people than Arm and Qualcomm, because Arm and Qualcomm feed IP to OEMs and device makers that make products that end up in our hands. So you mentioned 75% of smartphones, Pat. If all of a sudden 75% of smartphone market, you know, that and they don't have all of that 75%, but 75% that they address loses one of the biggest and the actually the biggest and you know is suddenly only what media tech left to provide, you would have a major 
bottleneck in the production exactly. of next generation smartphones. So who loses in the end? The OEMs lose, the resellers lose, the customers lose. Um, and so that's what, you know, to some extent makes this almost like a, uh, a popular opinion battle more than a technology is because a judge is going to have to not only rule on the, the law and the legal basis, but also on the impact that making any sort of kind of what I would call really substantial decision could have on the industries that these companies feed. You're talking about cars, you're talking about laptops, you're talking about phones. And of course, you're talking about a company that depends on royalties, another company that basically creates multiple, very large, hundred plus billion dollar valued companies, most of the equipment or pieces of what the intellectual property they need to build their products. This becomes fascinating. Um, in the end, I think you hit it on the head. There has to be common ground. I just do not see any situation in which these companies are not brought together to have to fight. Are they negotiating? I couldn't tell you for sure. Should they be? I think it benefits everyone in the ecosystem that they find that common ground. Having said that, um, I'll, I'll end where I started. You know, Qualcomm is very good. They deal with this in stride. There was very little, uh, you saw very little sort of emotion in this as we were around a lot of the executives this week. Seems like just another day of business. Um, so Pat, we're we'll have yeah. to look closely. No, I'm glad you pulled that up, right? Like it wasn't a bunch of Qualcomm people running around. Like it was just, you know, literally like another day uh, out, uh, uh, out there. And I know there was some discussion about, you know, uh, you know, parties not negotiating, which I would just find you know, weird, you know, maybe this is a lawyer to lawyer thing, but uh, yeah, it's uh, this is a, this is a good one. You know, the chip wars are, 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 are I love chip wars. The only thing I, I like, uh, you know, that, that second after chip wars is uh, enterprise SaaS version versus agent wars. <laughs> That's that been only started last week though. That wasn't, a th I'm joking. I, what did you tweet about that? Like five months ago, six months ago, you put out a tweet kind of, <laughs> reviewing that this was about to happen on the, on the, on the agent stuff that was pretty good. Yeah, I was sitting in uh, Google cloud next and I'm just like, Oh, what, what, you know, what Google's not saying is uh, agents can potentially replace uh, enterprise SaaS, which, which got no traction uh, on that. But uh, yeah, Benioff uh, really, really likes uh, Copilot uh, here. Anyways, let's move to the next topic here. We're going to do a two for here, folks. So we've got IBM uh, Q3 earnings and IBM introduced some very provocative enterprise uh, LLMs, which I'll let Daniel talk about first. Um, yeah, so I'll start off. I'll talk a little earnings and then maybe we do the second part. Let's talk about the, the yeah. Granite 3 launch because it is a bit of a twofer and there is a, a bit of a thread to tie it all together, Pat. But you and I had a great opportunity to sit down with CFO uh, Jim Kavanaugh on earnings day, get the rundown from the company. It sold off pretty hard in the wake of its results. Uh, revenue growth was seen as a little bit slow. Now, this is a company that's historically been valued more on free cash flow than on growth. We know that under the Remedi era, it didn't grow at all most of the most of that time. We know in the Arvind Krishna era, it's been kind of what you would call low and mid single digit growth. Um, this era has been the hybrid cloud and AI. I think we both agree and we've said many times that the company's focus has been better in this era. I think the spinoff of Kindrel, the removal of certain parts of the business that just weren't uh, priority, weren't focus areas for the company has been good. You know, it's a strategy of sort of playing hybrid cloud and playing partner to the hyperscalers as opposed to really meaningfully trying to compete has served the company well. But I think there's been a lot of what I kind of call, you know, puts and takes, push and pull with the company where once some part of it starts to grow the way it should, some other part starts to pull back. It's got the cyclicality angle to it. So it was a very tidy quarter from an operations and finance standpoint, you know, the continued ability to create cash flow, to deliver, um, you know, op inc and, and, and percentage op inc has enabled the company to at least show growth and kind of continually hit the EPS results that it's been promising to the street. The, the challenge is, is it's seen this great growth. I mean, you're talking about a $3 billion order book on I, on uh, AI, about what I think we heard a, a number of something like four-fifths of that is consulting. The rest of it is software um, in, in the Watson family. Uh, and this is, you know, really encouraging. Having said that, somehow consulting isn't growing. 
which is a weird thing. Like you got all this demand, all this interest and all this need for consultants to be able to deliver and implement generative AI. They've got a great platform. I think the first real enterprise uh, end to end AI data governance platform. And yet, like I said, with all this order book, all this demand for consulting, um, the growth of the company's low single digits, the growth of consulting is actually negative. And so this has been the er interesting area to sort of navigate is how does the company deal with it having this powerful tailwind with AI, but kind of core technology consulting is down, core hybrid infrastructure is down, uh, Z is late in scale, uh, cycle. and anytime Z gets late in cycle, that really hurts the infrastructure number for the company because um, the good news is there's a new wave coming. The bad news is, is at that tail end, the revenue falls off hard and th therefore it becomes more and more pressure on the company to make up for that. Um, you know, the, other, the only other thing I'll say is that, you know, as we move to AI, it's very clear that the reason IT budgets are flat is that all the spend has moved to AI and all the other spend is basically just stopped <clears throat> right in its tracks. That's why you see on the chip side, CPU growth is 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 on the on data centers down to nothing. Um, and so if you don't have the ability to sort of uh, augment a lot of revenue over to AI and you're not getting enough there, you'll actually see a lot of growth get offset. And that's really what's happened here with, with IBM. There's no way to kind of split hairs about that. The good news, Pat, and I'm going to let you comment on earnings and maybe we go to Granite after that, is I do think the technology for the first time really is showing some strong market leadership. Uh, we're seeing that with customer wins, they're seeing it with use cases, they're seeing it with outcomes that consulting is driving. It's kind of one of those situations where all the good things haven't ever, haven't happened at one time for IBM in a long time. So, you know, we've seen some good Red Hat results or we see some good AI number results or we see a good consulting result or we see a good Z, but almost never all these things in one quarter. And so that's why it's kind of all been kind of at that low single digit, but to the credit of the company, it's dealing well with the fall off of the, of the more legacy businesses. It's done a good job offloading them. It's done a good job of offsetting them. And that's why at least the company continues to grow in the stock while it's fallen hard on this earning actually over the last couple of years has been a really good performer because the company has been so consistent. Yeah, that was a great breakdown. And yeah, I was surprised you would expect consulting to be off the charts. And then what you do is you look at the industry where Accenture just got back to growth. So I am expecting that, that IBM will get back to growth uh, with consulting. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I, asked Jim twice uh, about consulting to break it down. And, you know, at the end, after a little bit of research, it made sense for me that those dollars are not, are, are moving from consulting uh, to doing POCs. You might think that, well, you know, doesn't it take consulting uh, to do a POC? Not always. Uh, and again, at the end, I look at Accenture, then just getting back to growth. Uh, you know, I'll do a side eye if we don't see some growth uh, uh, next quarter because IBM would not be moving with uh, uh, the market. But, um, I, you know, let's look at the, some of the bright side here, right? AI backlog is up 50%. Uh, oh. Red, Hat, Red Hat bookings year to day, uh, subscriptions up uh, 20%. And with that, carry stuff like uh, Ansible and everything uh, through it. ARR book on the software up, uh, up double digits. So, while that single digit uh, number is single digits, uh, there were some areas of growth where you would expect uh, that growth to be uh, driven from. The other thing I want to talk about is, is infrastructure, right? Um, IBM Z is in the longest, um, longest span of, of riding the current product line in the history uh, of Z, and, and we saw it. Uh, this quarter, right? Infrastructure uh, was down, uh, was down big time. And typically, you know, it has been, you know, uh, you know, one of the, I don't want to call it a savior because that's, uh, you know, uh, that's probably doing it too big, but, but they were just absolutely uh, crushing it. And they've been riding current infrastructure for about uh, uh, three years. Uh, there is a new platform that's uh, coming out in the first half 25, which should boost that. And again, there's two feeders to downstream revenue for, for uh, IBM. It's infrastructure and it's consulting. And if both of those aren't hitting in the same quarter, you're going to get what, what you are, are going to get. 
But hey, Daniel, let's uh, pivot to the future here and talk about these uh, uh, Granite uh, 300 models. So uh, the company came out, uh, made a, you know, what I think is its biggest uh, gr uh, announcements in, in AI, uh, aside from when it first came out with uh, Watson X. So this is the third edition of these Granite 30 models and to be very specific these are for business these are not for for consumers um, uh, first is uh, one called guardian and that's for guardrail capabilities the other one is an moe a mixture of of experts super low latency uh, for cpu deployments and edge computing you've got time series for uh, zero few shot forecasting uh, very, very high performance. Uh, you've got Code Assistant that uh, IBM has had a really good uh, uh, track record. Uh, and, and the overall comment I wanna make here is that obviously by 3.0, these aren't the first models, but for the first time, the company is hitting not only on performance and that's accuracy, but it's also hitting on efficiency. Um, and the reason to believe uh, here that these are better for business. And again, we have not done the testing at uh, Signal 65 yet, but uh, I do like the figures coming out from IBM that they look really good, uh, is, is that they don't test on world data. Uh, they don't test on golf scores. They don't test on the history of sports. They're not testing on recipes, vacations. And therefore your data set is smaller, but your data, and that means it's going to be higher performance. So for something that might take 100 B models, they can do with five. And, and I'm just throwing out numbers that aren't the exact numbers because they, they vary. Uh, and, and what does a smaller model mean? Is you don't need a Blackwell to run these models on. You can run them on, on the CPU. You can run them on an NVIDIA L40. You can run them on a lower end uh, AMD, which could make them uh, 10 to 20 times less costly to run your uh, to run your applications. This is this is IBM's big move. Uh, they need to pour on the gas on the promotion side, on the selling side, on the collaboration side with their partners like Adobe. Uh, and with SAP to make a, a resounding exclamation point uh, uh, on this. And from a positioning standpoint, the company needs to be very clear. There are models that op are optimized for consumer and there are op models that are, and services that are optimized uh, for, for the enterprise. And clearly, uh, this is for the enterprise. Good job, IBM. Yeah, Pat, you, you hit it. And so... I'll just double click on a couple of things. The future for most enterprises will be smaller, dedicated, focused models, okay? IBM, interestingly enough, it has a unique opportunity to be, and, and I say this very cautiously, but openly, uh, a real uh, alternative to the sort of NIMS, NVIDIA, and ecosystem, okay? The idea of being able to build industry models through the combination of smaller models, through the combination of having the, the data AI governance model, of having infrastructure access, and of course, being able to take great deep expertise into specific use cases is really the idea. Now, how that gets done can vary from company to company, from technology stack to stack, but where it all starts is having high fidelity, very accurate models that deal with language or deal with a specific use case and that is something that IBM is doing really well. And Pat, this stuff changes, it's incredibly fluid. And so this is a moment in time, the moment in time could change. And as we look at the, the, the possibilities and what could change, um, you need to understand that, you know, this is something that's fluid for the enterprises adopting it. Now, what I will say, and I, I kind of end here, cause you covered this so well, is that, Enterprises move at a different speed than the cloud, okay? And so this is why I really like IBM and this kind of idea of generative AI for the enterprise, Pat, is that enterprises are going to be looking to solve problems. They're going to be looking very cautiously at data. Governance and compliance are big concerns. Their ability to move at the speed of 
innovation in the silicon space is going to be slowed. And so they kind of have a couple of ways to address this, but there's a ton of need. Our data has shown this endlessly for capability and capacity, for specialty expertise. And so what I really like, and I sat with Rob Thomas last week, is I like, you know, I was talking to him, is I like the idea that they can bring together technology and consulting to implementation and do so in a very uniform way. And Pat, the other thing I like is that IBM is open in the sense of working with other vendors. So, you know, I said competitive NVIDIA, but they could also work alongside NVIDIA. Um, they could work alongside different public clouds and different offerings. They could work alongside different data lakes um, if they need to, because they can make the money in consulting, but they can also make the money. Now, the last thing here, Pat, is just to say, IBM's gap is the market identifying and seeing that its models are in fact really competitive, really valuable and belong in the conversation. So that's kind of what I'm saying here is after reviewing this, after looking at the data, after looking at the competitive posture and looking at the power and efficiency and accuracy of these smaller models, enterprises really do have permission to think very seriously about IBM as an alternative to do, you know, cost per token reduction with high fidelity to get enterprise outcomes. And so that's what IBM should be pushing. That's the opportunity and the challenge. And that's where I think the company could go. Good, good analysis there, Dan. Uh, looking forward to uh, potentially uh, testing uh, out. Yeah, all the we got to get that in the lab, uh, man. I would love to get these uh, uh, inside of uh, Signal 65. Let's move to the uh, next topic. Uh, which, you know, we hate semiconductors, but a uh, big story uh, came out here that the uh, NVIDIA Blackwell design flaw was fixed. Uh, CEO Jensen Wong uh, came out and said this uh, directly, and he also said that uh, the issue was 100% an NVIDIA design issue, and it was not a, a TSMC issue. You know, there was a ton of news cycles on this, Dan, mm -hmm. which was uh, big rumors uh, came out uh, that that there was an issue. Uh, there wasn't uh, a lot discussed, uh, actually nothing discussed from the company, from NVIDIA. Uh, it was during their quiet period and you need to watch uh, what you do say, but it was uh, addressed um, on the, the earnings call by uh, Jensen uh, himself and also uh, Colette with in the uh, financial uh, note that 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 she uh, put out, and uh, I believe it, it appeared to be you know one of the higher end variants of 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 the platform, <clears throat> and you know, there's two two different variants of this, and these would go to the mega hyperscalers. Um, the highest, uh, the highest tier folks. So um, that swirled uh, for a little bit, uh, but on their earnings call, Nvidia, you know, stuck to their guidance, right? And then over the last, uh, you know, couple of weeks, uh, uh, I believe it was Jensen himself saying that the company was sold out for Blackwell for the next twelve months. Uh, TSMC had been talking. There was this, uh, again, uh, you know. We follow Nystead. Maybe this was a Bloomberg uh, uh, article that, that discussed that, hey, there was this uh, finger pointing that went on between uh, TSMC uh, and, and NVIDIA. And by the way, you know, I worked at a chip company, spec the chips I wanted from chip companies, been doing this for <clears throat> nearly 35 years. And there's always finger pointing between uh, a design group and the group that actually has to to build something i mean my gosh we had that at amd all of the time when we had our own uh at, had our own fab and it was like the the classic spider-man meme right they're all pointing uh, uh fingers uh, at each other but um uh jensen popped that balloon saying this was 100 percent uh nvidia and did not have to do with uh tsmc uh, it, it is wild, though. I mean, here's the deal. Uh, there are multiple spins on ships all of the time, right? And typically, you know, if you can't fi fix it in, in software, you fix it uh, in firmware. If you can't fix it in software or firmware, you have to do uh, typically uh, a spin. If it's a yield issue, you don't aut automatically need to do a metal spin. But if it's a, it's a design issue, you typically have to do a metal spin, and that'll set you back 30, 30 to 60, sometimes upwards of, of 90 days. And hopefully, 
you're not doing uh, pedal to the metal manufacturing because you're gonna have to grind up all of those chips uh, that you did and 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 start uh, the clock uh, ticking again. But uh, crisis averted. Design flaw is fixed. Blackwell sold out for 12 months. And by the way, the, the final thing is was always our contention that you know anything over a, a 60 or a 90 day uh, delay would have no material impact to the company because they would just buy the lower performance chips. There was some question on, you know, on the lower performing chips prior generation, uh, whether you could get your supply chain uh, in gear. There was also discussion about share shift uh, to NVIDIA. But again, if you've made the decision on NVIDIA, you're likely, you're gonna go with NVIDIA. The only question is which variant. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Um, Pat, I think you really said it well. This is a process that historically just doesn't get this much attention. It, it just doesn't. This is part of the ongoing optimization that goes during each each launch and each ramp phase. You know, constant work to improve yield, constant work to improve performance. Um, and Pat, I think you were the original call out on the, the mask change that was going on. And Oh my gosh, in fact, it was live yeah. on on CNBC yeah. uh, with uh, with John Fort, and I'm literally I'm reading Colette's uh, uh, piece uh, on air. Thank you for calling that out, but yeah, well, I mean, look, um, it, it, you know, we may not get Rogan numbers here yet, but there's some really good stuff in this pod. So hopefully, all you that are watching, you know, stick with us, share with your friends, especially if you're into chips and tech. But uh, Pat. This is a this is a fluid process to in and, and, and I don't think a lot of people appreciate the pace of innovation that Nvidia and now AMD and others are pushing. This work was hard to do on like three year cycles. Yeah, doing this on annual cycles is incredible. Um, and by the way, the the fix without really having any meaningful hurt to demand was 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 great. I I'm reading a trend force data report about this. Is Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Meta, Oracle, and CoreWeave have bought all of the GPUs, all the Blackwell that, that NVIDIA can make for like the next several quarters. I don't know if that's two, three or four, but they're basically saying these handful of companies own it, got it, and <laughs> NVIDIA is looking like they're gonna be in really great shape. Sorry, bubble bears. Uh, your NVIDIA shorts probably are not gonna print anytime soon, but enjoy that. Enjoy the, enjoy the stress. Maybe you'll get it right one of these quarters. You know, it's 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 kind of like, by the way, the, the the bears around AI right now. It's kind of like being the guy playing the don't pass line. You're just the asshole at the table right now. Um, having said that, you know the big short. You know the world's premise has been made on. There are a few people that sometimes get it right when they're betting against. Um, I think Bill McDermott actually said the other day on CNBC. He basically said everybody, anybody that's betting against AI right now is going to be regret it big time. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've been on air like. 20 times all right how long is this going to last and like, infrastructure 12 to 18 months well why it's the same thing it's fomo yeah With the hyperscalers who view this as a once in a multi-decade opportunity to go in and get get share shift no. share shift but also platform shift right uh moving people around like everybody uh views this as a way uh as a way to get up on the competition, expand the TAM, get into businesses that, that they're weak in. And, and yeah, it, it, it's freaking it, it's FOMO with the caveat, which, which I said is if you have investors of the hyperscalers um, calling for action on CapEx, okay, that would be an issue. And the only, the only way that would happen is if we got into a recession or back into a recession. So anyways, I'm sticking to my guns. I'm not always right, but I sure am consistent. But I feel like yeah. for the most part, I'm, I'm right on the stuff that matters. Yeah, well, you get it every once in a while. So the, the, the TLDR is uh, crisis averted. Demand is incredible. AI is in a good position. Consumption is still the question mark. Are there other companies besides NVIDIA that are really going to make money on AI? Yes. Uh, is that obvious just yet? No. It's still it's still a work in progress, but I think we know where that kind of is and where it's going, uh, Pat. And of course, if Nvidia can keep getting these hyperscalers to buy a hundred plus billion dollars a year every year for a new uh, a new node, now they've got to figure out how to charge enough per hour per GPU 
<laughs> to make money. But of course, they're building products on it. They're training data sets on it. There's not it's not just rent on these hyperscalers. There's lots of different ways to make money. Pat, we got one more topic, don't we? Yeah, and I'm glad you did that. And by the way, uh, catch catch my uh, breakdown of semiconductors. I'll be in Power Lunch on CNBC. What uh, day? Today. Oh, no, shit. I'm on Monday. Excellent. How about that? Yeah. Well, they couldn't have you on three times a week, Dan. So oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I'm glad. I'm yeah, glad. so uh, catch that out. So let's go into our last topic. Uh, SAP cranked out some earnings. Dan, did we see some AI magic? Did we see the, the cloud? Uh, cloud backlog grow once again what's going on here yeah so you know that's been the uh that's been the strength pat of the company it's had strong cloud results it's had strong um uh, cloud growth cloud backlog it's starting to be able to tell a bit more of a of a story on how it's going to have ai you know it's restructuring is sort of uh starting to move behind it uh, you're starting to see how it's not just you know pure erp but it's hr it's customer experience. It's got, you know, concurrent expense management and the ability to take what it's doing with AI to take its cloud transformation uh, seem to be really well received in this particular uh, this particular quarter, Pat. So, um, you know, was it a surprise? I mean, look, they're at an all time high right now. So is this another uh, AI bubble? I mean, look, I, I think this has been a company that's been pretty conservative. I think they've partnered a lot on AI, but certainly haven't overstated where they see AI uh, being part of its business. They've, you know, seen they've executed well on cost cutting. They've seen what thirty percent growth in their cloud contracts, and they're starting to see AI more as a meaningful. Um, and of course, they're seeing their cloud ERP suite, so twenty-seven percent growth there. So, you know, Pat, across across the board. Um, the company is doing doing really well. They're growing operating profit. They're growing. Um, and back, just to be clear, 30 percent of their cloud contracts now are inclusive of AI use cases. So is this the magic AI revenue number in the number? No, it's not. But what they're starting to say is that people that are moving to their cloud or expanding their cloud contracts are doing so because of the implementation of AI, which is what people want to hear about. You know, as we've talked to the company, you and I have talked to Christian many times. We've talked to others. Um, Pat is, is, you know, we do believe that they're doing things, uh, you know, very, very strategically. They're moving methodically. They're not overstating their capabilities. They're winning um, and, and working hard to keep customers. It's going to be very competitive with them and Oracle over the next few years. And of course, they have to deal with the same trend we talked about with agents and, and assistants. And how do we, you know, sort of deprecate some of the complexities on the front end of these systems? and make it more powerful. But what, where this company's gold lies is in its data. You know, among the richest data sets on the planet, they've got more access to more data for more enterprises um, in more geographies. And they do so, and they've always done so in ways that are very responsible from a data, uh, you know, sovereignty standpoint and residency and lineage. So I like the company's, uh, I like the company's prospects, Pat. You know, this was a pretty straightforward, very successful quarter. And uh, congratulations to SAP. It may not always be the most exciting company, but you know what? Right now, data is gold and uh, it is the absolute enabler of a future of AI agents and assistants. Yeah, good breakdown there. And I just, I just love this story because you know, there's a lot of questions about the vi there were a lot of questions about the viability of SAP based on how quickly it, it got in, in in the cloud. And while I do think that SAP was late uh, to the cloud, I also need to recognize that uh, moving anything that if it breaks uh, can take down your entire business. It takes down your manufacturing. It takes down your billing. It takes down your inventory. It takes down your finance financial system. You just don't want to move that. And I also want to recognize that there are customers who don't want to change anything. Okay, and I think uh, based on you know three different variations, the pathways for customers to get uh, to the cloud. Um, uh, finally, SAP is basically, you know, sending its message to its customers, you know, we're, we're going to move, we're going to move, we want to move with you. But we also recognize that, that there are some of you who, who just, who just won't go. And there's two ways to deal with this, right? Oracle cut, just cut customers off uh, on a certain date. 
uh, that the time that it took for them to get over was lower, but they just they, they cut them off. I'm actually good to see this transition uh, for uh, uh, for the company. Uh, operating profit was up 28 percent. I mean, cloud backlog up 29 uh, percent, just absolutely crushing. They raised their outlook for 2024 higher operating profit and free cash flow. Uh, the AI stuff is is significant, right? In in that um, even the size uh, of of these cloud deals, you know, sixty five percent of these cloud deals uh, were over uh, uh, five million uh, uh, euro, uh, and the AI attach rate is actually quite shocking to me, right? Because you have a customer set that is hyper hyper. Uh, seems to be hyper conservative uh, on this, but the ability to put that 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 in there, I think, is super highly impressive. Yeah, Dan, the data is gold, right? Imagine, you know, every widget you ever made, right, uh, on the factory floor, every element of distribution you ever had, every single supplier you had, every single customer that paid you a cent and the payment terms, having 20 years of history that you can put generative AI on top of to get uh, to get insights. I mean, talk about uh, skipping a beat, right? Uh, skipping a layer uh, on there. I think it's just super fascinating. And I look forward uh, to see what SAP does on their data platform uh, in, in the future, right? We've seen uh, Benioff with Salesforce lean into it hard. Gosh, he devoted 50% of his time on an earnings call to just uh, uh, talk about data. Data so, cloud. Exactly. Right? ServiceNow. Raptor. Yeah, ServiceNow leaning in uh, uh, hard, hardcore. And I'd like to see 30, 40, 50% of the next earnings call going through uh, everything that that's data because it, you know it's funny. Sales and marketing data is great, but 20, 25 years of manufacturing, finance, distribution, supplier, customers, uh, that that is literally uh, solid gold. Yeah, Pat. Just just uh, one last thing on the way out. I mean, there is going to be consolidation. And that's the fight. And that's going to be really exciting. Great for competition. Great for use. People will not want to have 27,000 platforms. Yeah. Do we, want to, do we want to broach this, Daniel? Uh, I can't now. I okay. do want to do this, though. I have a meeting that's been waiting for me. But yes, for everyone out there, I, what do you guys think about us doing the agent wars? Maybe having a, a bit of a, of, a, of a breakdown and a battle and a little fun conversation on this show about who's going to win the AI wars in enterprise software. Pat, how about this? I had an idea. We're going to release our enterprise apps and software, future of intelligence and data report that's going to have the market size, CAGR, category decision data in the next few days. How about um, I come on and you give me a platform to absolutely just blow my own whistle for about 30 minutes. I'm kidding. But we'll we'll use that as a, as a background to talk about why it's only growing 8% and who are going to be the real winners um, maybe next week or in one of our episodes upcoming. Very provocative, Dan. Very provocative. Hey, uh, next week, uh, Dan and I will be out at uh, Cisco Partner Conference. I'm making a quick stop up at uh, Amazon Web Services to do a meet and greet with uh, CEO Matt Garman. Looking forward to that. Going to meet with a bunch of press people, too. Uh, and then, gosh, th this this is five weeks on the road, baby. I'm, uh, I am falling apart. Uh, car parts uh, falling off, uh, engines, uh, everything, but uh, got, got to stay in there. And also, if you get a moment, uh, I talk more chips. I was on a podcast with Scott Galloway, uh, the Prof G podcast with him and Ed, Ed Elson. I uh, had a good discussion on NVIDIA, Intel, the entire semiconductor uh, value chain. I put the, all those links on my LinkedIn uh, and X. Uh, check Dan and I out next week, uh, this week, on our uh, broadcast appearances. Dan has like 27. I think I have two 
uh, uh, coming up. I'm just Question today, Bestie. That's uh, yeah, no, uh, I've uh, seen you on this show before, so yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you just weren't available, or you know, you were on CNBC too many times. Uh, uh, this huh? no, 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 no. When it comes to what you talk about, there's nobody better than you. Ah, Bestie, thank me. you. <laughs> that's so good right. I, I i have to go yep. Let's thanks everybody for tuning in uh give us uh feedback we really appreciate you try to relax uh this weekend i know i'm going to try i don't do a very good job at it but back on the road up in the air at seven uh at seven on sunday take care y'all